Are you familiar with the term shandification? It is perfectly understandable if you are not, because it was coined by a YouTuber named Mr. B Tung in a video from about a decade ago. That video was called The Shandification of Fallout. The term shandification is derived from Tristram Shandy, a novel written in the 1700s. For those interested, I recommend watching the video. Unfortunately, the original upload was DMCA copyright claimed by the woke NBA, but I'll provide a link to a re-upload in the description. Mr. B. Tung seems to me like an interesting guy, and I hope he'll return to YouTube one day and rectify this issue, as well as start uploading new content again. But he's been dormant since 2013. Anyway, his Shandification video predates H. Bomber Guy's more well-known Fallout 3 critique by a few years, and it does an excellent job of illustrating why the storytelling in New Vegas is vastly superior to that of Fallout 3. Because Shandification, as he points out, is when the setting becomes the story. Let's bust out my sloppy MS Paint diagrams again. Here, it's possible to describe A, B, C, and D as the story, and everything else as the setting. In a linear narrative, like you'd find in a book or a movie, setting details are only included when they're directly relevant to the story. Any irrelevant ones will have a hard time justifying their presence in the text. But as a story becomes less linear, as it becomes more shandified, the distinction between story and setting begins to dissolve. The setting becomes the story, and vice versa. Keep this in mind as I finally start talking about the ostensible subject of the entire video. This is something that New Vegas does so very well, but Fallout 3, as well as 4 and 76, not so much. The main, and I suppose really the only example Mr. B. Tung brings up in his video, is the question, what do they eat? If they have so much in common, then why is it that I thought Fallout 3 was merely good? while I thought New Vegas was one of the best games I've ever played. You can probably see this answer coming a mile away, but here it is anyway. The world of New Vegas was more effectively shandified. I'll demonstrate what I mean by asking an obnoxious and repetitive question, a question I often ask when exploring fictional worlds. That question is this, what do they eat? This was, of course, just an example. It was the only example he brought up, but in my own videos I brought up some additional questions, such as in my recent lore video on Sarah Silver where I asked the question, where does she get her drugs from? She either creates the drugs herself, or someone is supplying them to her, but the game neither shows nor tells how this is the case. Another example would be, where does Silver go to the bathroom? when her house doesn't even have a bathroom? And where does Lucas Sims take his prisoners, when Megaton doesn't have a jail in it? These are questions I raise in my videos. These questions are similar to the question, what do they eat? And I'm sure you can think of many other examples where Fallout 3 fails to provide any answer. And for a lot of players, and to be honest, probably most, they don't even think of these questions, and nor do they care. Their eyes are glued to the quest marker, and they do not take the time to notice or ponder the details of the world around them. This, in a nutshell, is how you can tell the difference between a Fallout fan and a Bethesda fan. To be fair, sometimes they overlap, but these are separate and distinct communities, and each will view the respective games of the other side as boring. Bethesda fans consider the nuanced storytelling of New Vegas to be boring, whereas Fallout fans consider the looter-shooter, quest-marker following, and bad writing of Bethesda games to be boring. Both consider the other to be boring. And what is boring or not is entirely subjective, so no matter what their opinion is, they're right. Bethesda fans are right that New Vegas is boring, and New Vegas fans are right that Bethesda games are boring. But in very different ways. That's why there is a division in the community which is irreconcilable. 
Fallout 3 fails in its design regarding what the entire main plot revolves around. Water. Or, to be more specific, purified water. We are told that the lack of purified water is the biggest problem in the Capital Wasteland, yet the game does a piss-poor job of showing us that this is the case. Most NPCs throughout the game seem to be content with whatever irradiated water they have. Go to any major settlement and the issue of water is seldom brought up. Instead, NPCs have nothing but free time to squander building Rube Goldberg machines, LARPing in costumes like children, or being obsessed with Nuka-Cola. The game doesn't do an adequate job of showing us that the lack of purified water is a major issue that weighs heavily on everyone's minds. But the game does tell us this. The only exception to this rule is with a handful of water beggars outside of the major settlements. You gotta give these water beggars credit because they alone carry the entire rationale of Fallout 3's main plot upon their shoulders. They are like the mighty arms of Atlas holding the heavens from the earth. Aside from them, and them alone, no one else in the game seems to give a shit. Everything that James is doing, and his noble sacrifice, it is for these water beggars alone. Do it for you. Only the water beggars care that their water be purified. They insist that their water be purified. Everyone else is content to drink regular irradiated water. But the beggars will allow themselves to literally die of thirst rather than drink regular water. So it turns out that beggars really can be choosers, after all. Now, as for the question, what do they eat? Well, it is true that on the hierarchy of needs, food is a bit less important than water. You can live for quite some time without food, but without water you'll die within a few days. These water beggars don't have water, but they also don't visibly have access to food either. Unless this refrigerator in the ruins of Springvale happens to be Mickey's secret stash. So what do the people in Fallout 3 eat? That's the main question Mr. Beetung asks in his video. It starts with the town of Megaton, but it doesn't end there. What do people in Rivet City Tenpenny Tower, Canterbury Commons, Paradise Falls, the super mutants in the DC ruins, and so on and so forth, eat. About five years after Mr. B. Tung made that video, another YouTuber named Many a True Nerd made his infamous Fallout 3 is better than you think video which was primarily intended to be a response to H. Bomber Guy, but he did briefly mention the shandification of Fallout at one point. You see, there's an old video from about five years ago that discusses Fallout 3 in New Vegas called The Shandification of Fallout, which basically discusses how games work better if their basic logistics have been thought through, and it's obvious how basic human needs are being met. So in the case of Megaton, the city has food because the one upside of the apocalypse is that wildlife is massive now, and there are plenty of mole rats right by the side of the town. As for water, well, when the bomb hit but didn't detonate, it made a crater, one deep enough that the town has access to groundwater. Sure, it's radioactive, but so is all water. That's kind of the point of the main plot. The game literally begins with your dad talking about the waters of life and going on to tell you how terrible life is outside the vault. And then the very first town you get to after you leave uses a puddle in a radioactive crater as its water supply. And he disingenuously and incorrectly tried to explain the town of Megaton, making sense, because, as Matin erroneously claims, when the bomb hit but didn't explode, it somehow comically hit the ground with such force that it blasted a crater all the way down to groundwater, and that this groundwater is the town's water supply. I've debunked this in depth in my direct response to his video, and so has Kretosis in his eight hour long response. There are many reasons why Matin is wrong, but perhaps the most damning thing is what one of the characters within the game tells us. When the war happened, the machines started dropping from the sky. Everyone around here thinks that the bomb made the crater, but it didn't. 
Matin boasts about he knows where all the characters in the town sleep, yet he apparently never considered it to be worth his time to actually talk to them. You just know that Fallout 3 really is better than you think when the person who makes this claim didn't think it was even worth his time to talk to the characters in the game. There's a lot of other reasons why Matin's arguments don't add up, but I don't think it is worth rehashing here. However, in regards to Megaton's food supply, Matin had this to say. The city has food because the one upside of the apocalypse is that wildlife is massive now, and there are plenty of mole rats right by the side of the town. And again, this was something that both me and Kretosis responded to and debunked in detail. There is no evidence that anyone in Megaton hunts or eats the mole rats. There is not a single instance of mole rat meat in the entire town, and Moira's own dialogue in her repellent stick quest has her suggesting the idea that mole rats could be domesticated for their milk. Those poor little mole ratties. Oh, I wonder if I could make a hypoallergenic version. Oh, but that'd hardly be effective. I should mention that. Proper handling of mole rats could be important if they could be domesticated. Milked, maybe? This strongly implies that domestication of mole rats isn't something that has been tried before. Now, to be fair, Moira is a little bit what I suppose could be considered crazy, but what she says about mole rats matches up with what we see in the game. We do not see anyone in the entire game domesticating or attempting to domesticate mole rats. Even the domestication of Brahmins is fairly uncommon in Fallout 3, despite the fact that Brahmins are the sole pack animals used by caravans. Compare and contrast this with the original Fallouts, where domestication of Brahmin is widespread, and in the town of Modoc in Fallout 2, there is even an example of a deathclaw that has been domesticated, or at least captured for the harvesting of its eggs. The town of Megaton has two places which supply food, the Brass Lantern and to a lesser extent Moriarty Saloon, which mostly focuses on booze. In neither location will you find any mole rat meat. So Matin's argument that the mole rats are the town's food supply is incredibly disingenuous. Even more so because he says this over footage of himself using the repellent stick as part of Moira's quest. The reason those mole rats are there is most likely because of this very same quest, not because it's the town's food source. And what do the mole rats themselves eat? You can't support an ecology without plants, which form the foundation of any food chain. Outside of Oasis, there's just some brown clumps of dead grass sparsely scattered about, and that's it. I had suggested in my video about the lack of a jail in Megaton that Sheriff Sims takes criminals out back behind the town and summarily executes them there. You might think that's a joke, but it's also the best serious answer I can think of to explain the mole rats being there. They aren't there to eat plants because there are no plants, but they may be there to eat the dead bodies from Sims's wasteland justice. So, if my theory is correct, then the mole rats aren't Megaton's food source, but instead it's the other way around. Megaton is the mole rat's food source, and they probably also eat the bones, which is why you don't see any skeletons back there. I'm not joking in saying this, this is a serious theory. And I can back this theory up with a line of dialogue from Fallout 2 by a character named Slim Pickett, who lives in the town of Klamath, which has a bit of a problem with a rat infestation. Slim Pickett has this to say, People been disappearing, just them as are slow and sickly for now. Of course, they don't stop to cook their food like us. They just gnaw it into a few bloody clumps of hair and rags. Least that's all we find in the morning. I've even heard talk that there's some kind of giant rat god that tells them all what to do. 
The giant rat god he is referring to, which tells the other rats what to do, is a sentient talking rat. But that's a topic for another video, and I won't get into that for now. The relevant part, which I would like to focus on, is where he says, They just gnawed into a few bloody clumps of hair and rags. At least that's all we find in the morning. This means that the bite force of the mole rats is such that they can gnaw through human bones. And this is why, when they eat a human, they don't leave behind a trace. The bones are eaten as well. So, this is a good explanation for why we don't find any skeletons behind the town of Megaton, like we would expect if Sims is depositing the bodies of raiders and criminals back there. The mole rats eat them so thoroughly that only bloody clumps of hair and rags remain. So, a bloody clown wig and chewed up rubber nose might be all you could expect to find of Bapo. Even his very bones would be gnawed up by the mole rats' incisors. The largest species of rodent ever known was an extinct South American species that lived two to four million years ago, named Josepho artigasia monesi. The estimated size of this colossal rat was ten feet in length and five feet in height. It is estimated to have weighed about the same as a small car. A study was done to determine the bite force of this colossal rat, and the resulting estimate of the study put its bite force at 4,165 newtons of force, or about three times the biting power of a modern tiger. Josepho artigasia monesi was a real giant rat which lived millions of years ago, and it gives some idea of what the giant mole rats of Fallout might be like. Yeah, they would eat you, and they would leave only bloody clumps of hair and rags behind. So that is my explanation for why there are those mole rats behind the town, and why we don't see any skeletons, even though we know that raiders died attempting to storm the town. Their corpses were devoured by the mole rats, bone and all. At the start of Moira's repellent quest, she says, Mole rats can burrow into almost anything and cause a lot of trouble. So I figured I'd make a chemical repellent stick for people to shoo them off. Mole rats burrow into almost anything, she says. So she created the repellent to shoo them off because their burrowing is apparently an issue. And this does make sense because real life mole rats, which are far smaller, are well known for burrowing. So logically, their giant post-apocalyptic counterparts would also be burrowers. But we do not see this in-game. Whenever we do encounter mole rats, they're usually on the surface or inside some sort of structure, like in Smith Casey's garage. We can assume that they burrowed to get inside these places, but the game doesn't show us where and how they did. But I have to give Fallout 3 credit because, as we all know, the town of Megaton is surrounded by walls, and that is the town's defenses. So having these mole rats burrowing under the walls at the rear of the town is a serious problem that undermines the town's defenses and could cause the entire rotten structure to collapse. It's ironic that these dumb rodents have a smarter idea in how to assault Megaton than human raiders like Bapo, who apparently died like a bitch in a suicidal bonsai charge, where they were quickly mowed down by Lucas Sim's overpowered Chinese assault rifle. No, these mole rats in the rear are playing it smart, but Moira is on to them, and she has devised this repellent accordingly, so I'll give the game credit because this sorta makes sense. In New Vegas, we see a so-called mole rat ranch, where it seems that someone has finally domesticated mole rats. In the game, we find the ranch to be abandoned, and there is a mad Brahmin which has invaded the ranch and killed all of the mole rats. This mole rat ranch is a very interesting place, and it will be fun to cover that in its own dedicated lore video at some point. 
We don't know what happened to the owners of the ranch. My assumption is they became displaced like so many others throughout the Mojave as a result of the war between the Legion and the NCR and everything surrounding it. Myra wrote the Wasteland Survival Guide, and while we can't actually read this guide ourselves, it is likely that her theories on mole rat domestication were included in that guide, and we know this book made it to the Mojave because we find copies of it scattered throughout the game. So perhaps someone read Myra's book and decided to try their hand at mole rat ranching, or they just came up with the idea themselves. What this mole rat ranch in New Vegas shows us is that even though mole rats are not Megaton's food source, as Matten claimed, they can at least be a food source. If there's any chance that Bethesda is watching this video and they ever plan to remaster or remake Fallout 3, my sincere advice to them would be to create something like this mole rat ranch and have it located somewhere adjacent to Megaton. Also, have some crops growing around Megaton as well, because it's not healthy to live on a diet of meat alone, and plus the mole rats need to have something to eat themselves. This is how Megaton could become more properly shandified. But since Moira's dialogue suggests mole rat domestication isn't already a thing, then this dialogue either needs to be adjusted, or just hear me out on this, the ranch adjacent to Megaton should start the game off as being a purely Brahmin ranch, and you need to add in a few Easy Pete type characters in order to take it easy and look after those Brahmin. But then, later on, when doing Moira's quest, you could adjust it so that you can help her perfect her mole rat repellent and turn that into mole rat bait or something like that. And then walk up to the Easy Pete type characters that run the ranch near Megaton and talk them into agreeing to take in the mole rats and add them to their ranch. Of course, you should be able to complete the quest any number of different ways, but by doing it this way, it would probably be the most ideal outcome for Moira's book, and you'd see the world affected by it because mole rats would then become part of the Megaton Ranch, and then mole rat milk and or meat would show up on the menu in the Brass Lantern, and, you know, stuff like that. I think that would be a great way to improve the world design and make Moira's quest a lot better and more nuanced. That's my suggestion to Bethesda, and I understand that there are modders who have done similar things in order to improve the world design of Megaton, but the thing is, while modders can do this sort of thing, only Bethesda can decide what is or isn't canon. Modders can't fix a horrible cannon, so Bethesda are the ones that need to fix this. Aside from the mole rat ranch, New Vegas does have another example of mole rat domestication, which may or may not be the result of Moira's survival guide. We see this in the town of Sloan, where there is a domesticated pet mole rat by the name of Snuffles. Snuffles has an injured leg, which the courier can mend with sufficient medical skill. But unlike with the ranch, Snuffles is a pet and not domesticated for food. Domesticating mole rats for food may be a new phenomenon, but it should go without saying that undomesticated mole rats can and certainly have been hunted for food, just as anything else that has meat on its bones. In the post-apocalyptic world, no meat is off the menu, and that even includes the meat of human beings. In the post-apocalypse, you eat whatever or whoever you have to in order to survive, and this is certainly true with mole rat meat, just as it is true with human meat, dog meat, or any other type of meat you can think of. Slim Pickett in Fallout 2 says he loves the taste of rat. Well, they taste pretty good if you spit roast them with just a titch of herbs. And you can be sure countless others have done the same, because why wouldn't they? Grandma Sparkle 
in Fallout 3 claims that mole rat meat moves around in the stomach. But it don't move around in your stomach like mole rat does. This contradicts Slim Pickett. He likes the taste, but here on the East Coast, it seems to be another story. But opinions are entirely subjective, and there's no accounting for taste. In the process of doing my research on the town of Springvale, which, by the way, I have to say, has turned out to be a much more convoluted rabbit hole than I ever imagined it would be when I started, I discovered something very interesting and completely unexpected. You see, when you enter the main entrance of the school where the raiders have set up shop under Bapo's wise leadership, you will notice cages full of skeletons and blood and gore everywhere. It is like something straight out of a horror film. Some of this blood leaves a trail that leads off towards the left, and if you follow that, you may expect to find some dead human body or something, but what you will actually discover is a dead mole rat on a table. This dead mole rat apparently is the cause of the blood trail from the main entrance, and this table that the dead mole rat is placed upon is in a room that looks like it was some sort of staff room from back before the war. The elementary school doesn't seem to have a cafeteria, but this room seems to be where the teachers and staff ate their lunch and had a break or whatever, and the raiders seem to still be using it that way because there is food to be found here. So it would seem that this is where the raiders prepare and eat their meals. And this is very significant, because this dead mole rat being here, in this room, as opposed to anywhere else, implies that it is food for the raiders. Despite what Matten says, we never see this in Megaton, but to Fallout 3's credit, we do see it right here in the Springvale School. Bapo led his people to the Promised Land, where the water is sweeter, and the hunting grounds are teeming with herds of mole rats. Who would have thought that the shandification of this school full of raiders, which has no quests associated with it, and no major loot, or named characters aside from Bapo, would actually be better than that of Megaton, which is probably the biggest hub in the entire game? Who would have thought that? And yet, here we see the answer to Mr. B-Tung's question. What do they eat? Bapo had the answer all along, but no one ever thought to look until I started to unlock the mysteries of Springvale's lore. I can even offer you a solid clue on where this mole rat came from. If you head west from the school, following the river, you will come across what seems to be a guaranteed spawn point for mole rats in the game. I've checked this a number of times, and a few mole rats always seem to spawn right here. And this is close to the school, so it's probably where raider hunters bagged this mole rat for their dinner. But that's not all. I've done some additional research, and discovered some things while making this video that are mind-blowing. If you've ever seen my lore video on the legend of Bapo, I offer some suggestions on where he and the rest of the raiders in Springvale originated. However, one place that he may have come from, which I did not mention because it wasn't on my radar, is a place relatively nearby called Jury Street Metro Station. This is an interesting location where, among other things, You'll find gold ribbon grocers with the Rube Goldberg machine. There's also Hank's electrical supply, which is full of raiders, and a diner. It's an interesting location that I'll have to discuss in more detail at some point. But one thing I've overlooked is the tunnels beneath this town. I make it no secret that I hate the metro tunnels in Fallout 3. They are boring repetitive, and difficult to navigate, so I avoid them at all costs. But while avoiding these tunnels, I've missed some stuff here, which is very, very interesting, and also very relevant to the topic of this video. In the Jury Street tunnels, you will find raiders, and you will also find mole rats. The mole rats and the raiders seem to mutually hunt and devour one another. 
But when you explore these tunnels thoroughly, you'll find that things get even more interesting. Believe it or not, within these tunnels there is a raider scientist who goes by the name Ryan Brigg. He is, of course, hostile on sight, so you can't talk to him, but you can hack his terminal, and the journal entries you can read there are very interesting. Attempt number 86. I introduced a small component of isoprene. Didn't seem to make a difference in taste or composition. I'm not hopeful, but in the next round I'll increase the concentration, if only because damn stuff is so plentiful. Attempt number 87. The mole rats are starting to get more aggressive. I think we will have to push back our checkpoints a bit to make up for it. I wonder if my experiments with isoprene have somehow triggered their sudden increase in aggression. I wouldn't be so worried about it if I had something to show for it. There's got to be some way to make this meat taste better. Chucky won't shut up about the one he kept his pet being eaten by the others. I think I'll shoot him. That sort of thing seems to impress these raider types. Attempt number 171. I've noticed positive reactions with base dextrin substances. I'll continue testing different forms to see where it leads me. If there was ever a time for a breakthrough, it would be right now. Masquerading as one of these foul murderers grows tiring once the theatrics of it wear off. One thing is true, though, we can all be rich if the experiment succeeds. Mole Rat is one of the easiest mates to get hold of, yet the most disgusting. If I could turn it into a viable food source. Attempt number 172. Quite close now. I'm fairly certain the key ingredient is some form of thermostarch. My next attempt will be using Wonder Glue. The adhesive component contains a great deal of the stuff. Luckily, we have a small store of the stuff available here, and I'm offering a handful of caps to the raiders for every bottle they can bring me. Those grassy villains are handy when you got the money. Attempt 173. I finally done it. Who would have thought that the simple combination of mole rat meat and wonder glue would have been the answer? Curing the mixture together in the metal box produces a sort of jerky that is very pleasant to the palate. Chewy with a nutty taste. The usual toughness and better flavor of mole rat is completely undetectable. Further, I find that the meat has restorative properties. A man who eats a meal of this concoction will find himself feeling positively buoyant and anxious to move about. I'll be able to charge even more for it than I was originally planning. The only thing left to do is set up shop in one of the towns on the surface. None too soon. These filthy raiders have been my bane, and after all these long months, I'm as destitute as the worst of them. Odd. That's the alarm. Began Memwap. User initiated memory protocol. Began storage clear. Oldest archives first. Press in the button to interrupt. There's actually two terminals. One is located in the room where Ryan Briggs apparently sleeps and does his experiments. This terminal only has the final entry, the rest having been wiped. Another terminal can be found in another part of the tunnels, in an area overrun by mole rats. This terminal has more entries and more information than the other one. Next to this terminal, on the floor, is a partial skeleton, presumably Chucky, which Ryan Briggs' terminal entries imply that he killed. The entries state that the mole rats became more aggressive and that the raiders had to push back their checkpoints. I presume this is the reason why this area of the tunnels was abandoned by the raiders. Anyway, what we do know of mole rats from Fallout 2 
which featured sentient, talking examples, is that these creatures have the capacity for intelligence. These cruel experiments which Ryan Briggs is conducting in order to improve the taste of mole rat meat may have provoked the wrath of the vengeful mole rats. Especially if these experiments are being done on mole rats that are still alive, which is a very cruel thing to do to living creatures. But sadly, it is something that also does happen in real life as well. So this evil raider scientist named Ryan Brigg has captured some mole rat pups, and we see one is still alive in the cage. Another one in a nearby cage is dead, however. This scientist's name is Brigg which is very apt, because that is precisely where this degenerate belongs, in the brig, along with Anthony Fauci. It takes a truly sick and depraved mind to do this sort of thing to innocent pups. On a nearby table, we see a dead adult mole rat, much like the one in Springvale Elementary, as well as a bunch of cutlets of mole rat meat, there is also this strange contraption which, with the addition of Wonder Glue, turns regular mole rat meat into mole rat wonder meat. Let's talk about that. The Wonder Glue found throughout Fallout 3, as well as New Vegas, and every Fallout game thereafter, is an obvious reference to Super Glue, which is an acrylic glue which is not only inedible and toxic, but if you've ever used the stuff, you know there's no chance it could still be useful after 200 years. So even though the name is an obvious reference to super glue, it probably isn't that. More likely, it is some sort of starch-based glue, which would make it edible and non-toxic. And this makes sense, as one of the terminal entries mentions something about thermostarch. So it seems someone at Bethesda did their homework. As anyone knows, starch is used in a lot of food recipes and can even be used in making jerky, so this all checks out as far as I can tell. So I do have to give Bethesda credit on this one. Matin was dead wrong about mole rats being Megaton's food source, but they are a food source for the raiders, and there is even a raider scientist who has figured out how to make the mole rat meat taste better. This machine that converts mole rat meat and wonder glue into mole rat wonder meat is something that can be used and reused by the player infinitely. After killing Ryan Brigg, this place can also be used as player housing because there is an unowned bed and a safe which can be used for storage. I'm not sure if the raiders or mole rats respawn here, though. They might. But if they do, that might be a good thing anyway, because it means you can harvest more mole rat meat to use in this machine. The mole rat wonder meat doesn't just taste better, as Ryan Briggs says, but the healing power is massively increased. With the food sanitizer from Moira, it heals a whopping 24 hit points. In comparison with my current medicine skill, a stim pack heals about 50 hit points, so the mole rat wonder meat is about half as good as a stim pack. But as you know, stim packs are somewhat rare and very expensive. If you want to be a hardcore pro Fallout 3 player, it will behoove you to come to this machine often and continually crank out wonder meat so you can conserve your stim packs. That's my advice for those who want to be a Fallout 3 pro player. Mole rat meat is very easy to come by throughout the wasteland, although the Wonder Glue may be another story. One would expect a place like a school to be abundant in glue, so could this be the very reason why Bapo's expedition went to the Springvale school in the first place? Maybe Ryan Briggs sent them. We know from Briggs' terminal that he was paying raiders for every bottle of Wonder Glue they came across. It seems the raiders may have been doing their own sort of radiant fetch quest, just like how the player can hand scrap metal over to Walter in exchange for caps. These raiders could similarly turn in bottles of Wonder Glue to Ryan Brigg in exchange for caps also. Now that is something to think about. 
In addition to mole rats being the food source for the raiders, I also noticed near the entrance to these tunnels a small crate full of mute fruit, or mutt fruit. Not sure how you're supposed to say it. Here we see what the raiders eat, and we also see that they have some variety in their diet, although where this mute fruit came from is unknown, probably from raiding caravans or something, but where then did the caravans get it? Another thing I noticed near the entrance to these tunnels is this steel I-beam, which has a hammer and a lawnmower blade on it. This appears to be used as an anvil by the raiders. In one of my previous videos, I tried to figure out who built the cages in Springvale Elementary. Assuming these cages weren't there from before the war, then it probably means the raiders put them there. In order to create something like this, you need to have blacksmiths. And I explained that in the video. But there is no clear sign of blacksmith activity in the school, and I wasn't aware of there being any in the entire game. But here we see an example where something like that may have taken place. This place right here may have been where the cages in the school were forged. This place may be where Bapo originated, and together with his band of followers, took the cages forged by the raider blacksmiths here in these tunnels. And with these cages, as well as the knowledge of mole rat hunting, Bapo's gang set up shop in Springvale, and the rest is history. There is just one final thing I would like to add before I close this video. I was looking over some of the concept art of Fallout 3, which was created by the late Adam Adamowitz, who unfortunately passed away in 2012 from lung cancer, and I noticed this concept art of a giant mole rat. What makes this relevant to the topic of this video is this giant mole rat is mounted like a steed. So you can see that this is something Bethesda had planned, or at least considered adding into the game. But it got cut for whatever reason. My guess is console limitations or something like that. Who knows? But imagine if this giant mole rat had been included in the game. Imagine if Bapo had ridden into battle on one of these bad boys during his fateful attempt to storm the gates of Megaton. Imagine in the town of Megaton, Confessor Cromwell giving his sermon in the radioactive puddle next to the bomb, just as he does every other day. Suddenly, there are tremors causing ripples to appear in the puddle. The sniper Stockholm scans the horizon from his lofty perch high above the town. To his horror, he sees a huge army of raiders appear on the crest of a hill in the distance. The metal armor of the leader of the raiders glinting in the post-apocalyptic sunshine, sitting atop his giant mole rat steed. A great and epic battle ensues, not unlike the Battle of Pelennor Fields outside the city of Minas Tirith in The Lord of the Rings. A battle between the army of Megaton, led by Lucas Sims, and the army of Springvale, led by Bapo and his giant mole rat. This is the sort of game that Fallout 3 could have been.